Hello. Welcome to panel discussion, uh, the rise of the art collector, uh, private foundations as civic society actors. Uh, my name is Anna Klavinia. I am art critic and consultant. And uh, today I will be talking to very special guests uh, from uh, various private foundations across Nordic countries and Baltic countries uh, about this topic. Uh, so first we will have uh, Christine Buhl uh, Andersen from a new Carlsberg Foundation in Denmark. She is the chairman of this foundation. We will also have Kalle Korhanen from Kone Foundation in Finland. He is director of uh, funding uh, for art and research. And also we will talk to Vita Liberte from VV Foundation in Latvia. Uh, she is co-founder of this uh, foundation, which started its activities just, just a couple of years ago. The reason why we chosen this topic today is the fact that in Baltic states, where I come from, um, private foundations have been uh, increasingly opening uh, in recent years. They are focusing on various topics, on various support uh, systems, but art has stolen the, the limelight, one could say. Uh, there have been particularly many uh, private museums opening and various uh, art-related institutions. It is not a, a recent uh, phenomenon in Latvia, as early as as early 20th century, there were already some foundations, some philanthropic uh, entrepreneurs who supported various types of activities, especially in education. This process, however, was interrupted by Soviet occupation. So in a way, uh, people like Vita Liberte and uh, others uh, are starting this tradition again, reviving it, this tradition of supporting various uh, art and civic uh, society, uh, society activities. That's why it was very important for us to invite uh, colleagues from uh, Nordic countries where foundations have grew over years, even over centuries, and uh, have become very important players in uh, their societies. Um, that's why we will uh, try to learn what kind of vision, what kind of values have driven them and what one we can learn in our, let's say, um, newer societies in this regards in Baltic states. Uh, we will begin by uh, shortly introducing uh, each foundation. Then we will proceed with discussion. And at the end, we will also be happy to receive your questions, if you have some. So thank you very much for joining this uh, Nordic Talks session. And let's begin. I first want to give floor to Christina Buhl Andersen from uh, New Carlsberg Foundation in, in Copenhagen, which is, uh, contrary to its title, actually is the oldest of the foundations we are talking today about. So, Christine, thank you very much for joining us and please introduce us to your uh, foundation's activities and um, overall aims and goals. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, participate in this uh, really exciting and interesting uh, international um, seminar meeting on um, on the role of the foundations. Uh, it sounds really exciting what you are working on. So now I just wonder if uh, what you see on your screens, um, do you see a headline saying New Kasberg Foundation, does it work? Yes, we okay, do. Great, super. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Christine Bull Anderson and since March 2020, I've been the chair woman of the New Carlsberg Foundation, um, which, is, uh, which has been a very special sort of time to, to start working here. But anyways, uh, I think for all of us, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has, um, has been, oh, now I can't change the, uh, 
the slide. Uh, you, yes, okay. Um, has been challenging, and I think we've 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 learned something, but we've also been missing um, time before COVID. And uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about that. But first, a little bit about the history of the foundation. The New Carlsberg Foundation was established in 1902 by the Danish brewer Karl Jacobsen, um, who uh, stood behind the Carlsberg beer. Probably you know this brand and maybe you have also tasted it. Um, it's funded mainly by dividends from shares in Carlsberg AS. Um, and today uh, we continue to realize the vision that Jacobsen actually formulated um, at his time of promoting art in society and making it available to the widest possible uh, audience. He was a huge art lover himself. He was a collector. Um, he also funded the new Carlsberg Glyptothek with a fantastic collection of international artworks um, that is still uh, a very important part of um, the Danish cultural landscape situated in the heart of Copenhagen next to uh, Tivoli and uh, with great collections. But um, the foundation uh, was, was, was created by him in order to uh, share with the people all over the country, uh, no matter what social background they had, the joy of uh, meeting art of the best quality. And in many different ways, um, that is still the, the vision that uh, we um, uh, keep uh, also because it's part of our fund that's um, uh, on what we should do with the money the, that we get from the sale of the beer. So uh, in uh, 2019, as you can see, uh, the number of uh, donation, uh, the, the, the amount was about uh, 22.8 million euros, um, which is a lot of money. And you can say that um, in sort of uh, very big headlines, um, the donations fall into three main uh, categories. First of all, we help uh, Danish art museums with acquiring works of art, um, especially when it comes to international collections like at the Louisiana Museum or the National Gallery or also many other Danish art museums. Um, due to the very limited budgets they have, it's difficult for them to acquire artworks of international um, artists or even Danish artists at a certain level. Um, and so they can apply to us and we can help them with the donations of artworks. Um, sometimes we do that hand in hand with other foundations if the amount is too big. And for instance, we have helped uh, the National Gallery acquiring a Metis just to mention one uh, example. And um, of course, that's a very important uh, task because I think that very few other foundations uh, and certainly public uh, um, uh, sources have a great difficulty in, in especially that uh, purpose. So because, because of the art market, um, so it, it, in, that, in that sense, we play an important role. Then we have another uh, category of, of uh, art that we support, which is art in public spaces. And that's uh, very much like the public art foundations um, going back to Karl Jacobsen's time, because his idea was that the best place you can put living art is in public space, because that's where everybody meets it. And it also helps make better, have better cities, better lives in that could be in schools, uh, hospitals, and uh, also it's a good place for people to meet art. And still today, that's a very big activity uh, within what we do. And um, that in itself is a very interesting field that has developed a lot in terms of what kind of artworks um, are being produced today, in what kind of processes, whether they are temporary or permanent, and since he uh, he uh, donated the Little Mermaid, she's very famous at the Copenhagen Harbor front. Uh, I think a lot has happened. And then we also support research within art history, uh, especially at the museums, but also at the university. And um, especially we support collaborations between universities and art museums because of the Danish museum law. 
that uh, are, tells the museums to uh, do research at university level. And so because of their limited resources, the collaborations between the universities and the museums are a very important way to, to get that done. And also, I think that at the end of the day, the research in that way comes out as something the audiences can meet at the art museums in a very uh, interesting way, in many cases at least. Uh, and then we also have what you could say an open or not earmarked fund available for other art related pur purposes. So we are open to um, suggestions and applications um, that don't fall into any of these categories. Uh, just to give you an example of something we donated recently to a Danish museum, I will show you this artwork, which is by the German uh, artist Hito Stell, that you probably know. Um, very interesting filmmaker, um, video artist, music, uh, cross-disciplinary um, kind of work, interested in media, technology, global circulation of images, um, capitalism, etc. And, and this work has actually been acquired by a Danish museum situated in Aalborg with the help from us. So I think that's a way of um, uh, keeping a very high international level at, at the Danish arts museums um, and also to, to make it possible for people all over the country to meet uh, this kind of contemporary art. This is an example of a relatively new um, way of working that we have uh, uh, began with, and that's a donation to uh, Tate Modern in, in London, in the UK. Um, recently, we have donated works by Danish artists to Centre Pompidou, the Met in the New York, other great uh, art museums abroad, but in this, but always based on applications, never as something we want to sort of press uh, down in the collections from, from with some kind of nationalistic purpose, but always based on the artistic uh, quality of what the artists do. And in this case, uh, we were very surprised actually to see an application concerning very early work by Olaf Eliasson and also quite difficult uh, to handle in a collection, the Moss Wall from 1994, uh, because uh, um, it goes without saying that to cons conserve and preserve a, a work like this, that is uh, created by a natural material like Moss, uh, you have to be a really dedicated museum of art and uh, contemporary art. So we were very happy to help the Tape Modern with, with this acquisition. Uh, also because I think that it's an early work by Wolof Wallias and that doesn't um, copy many of the later works that most people perhaps know. And in that sense, I, we were really happy that the Tate Modern were, were interested in this piece. Um, and as mentioned, just to give you an example, we also work in public in, with art in public spaces. And um, this is a very recent work created by a Danish artist duo called Randi and Katrine. It's called Kofod Cigar. And as you can see, it's really a huge, big cigar. <laughs> it's uh, it's been given to a place called Kofod School, that since uh, during 90, almost 100 years, uh, has been helping uh, people with um, drug abuse, alcohol issues, homeless people, all kinds of um, people who who maybe feel a bit misfit into sort of normal society and uh, can uh, go to Kofu School to work in the workshops. They have shops, they have cafe and and uh, and uh, and this school was uh, we were asked by this school to to perhaps uh, donate an artwork and we were sure that we would like to do that but then we pointed out Randy and Katrine and they came up with this a bit controversial idea about creating a place for people to smoke. Because when you think about smoking today, I think it's prohibited in most public spaces, uh, at least in Denmark. And, you know, smokers are considered uh, losers and they should stop smoking and it's not good for your health. But in this case, the people who still smoke at the Kofu school actually felt uh, homeless and felt that uh, they needed a place to meet to have their cigarettes. So we accepted uh, that the artwork would be a big uh, outdoor smoking facility um, designed like a big cigar. So it's really a fantastic piece that has been created with the best of 
copper work on the roof and with a copy of, uh, they have been researching into how the vendor rolls of cigars have been looked, ha have looked over time and really done a lot of research on how cigars look and, and was just inaugurated last week. And I think it's been very well received by the users uh, at Kufu School. Quite controversial, but uh, yeah, uh, very beautiful too. This is an example of a publication we have supported. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to go to Venice for the Biennale of Architecture. It's been difficult to travel, unfortunately, but perhaps you will have the possibility. It's super interesting, uh, not only the art uh, biennials, but also the architecture biennials come up sometimes with the uh, very interesting subjects. And this year, it's all about the Anthropocene. I think the the overall theme of the Biennale is uh, how can we live together in the future? And when we say we, uh, we don't only think of human beings, but also of trees and fish and the nature, of course, because of the fact that we human beings have been quite arrogant in thinking about us contra nature instead of thinking about it as uh, with a perspective of, of connectedness. And this catalog was made for the Danish pavilion uh, it's um, it's an uh, encyclopedia or an um, anthology of texts that all deal with the Anthropocene from the perspective of architects, of artists, of anthropologists, uh, sociologists, um, geologists. And I think this cross-disciplinary um, idea was what we really liked about the project. And Actually, it has been super inspiring also for us as a foundation because we are looking into how in the future we can work more with the climate issue, even though we are an art foundation. How can we, uh, in our coming um, strategy, think about um, this uh, issue that is so important for, for all of us uh, on the earth at the moment? And I think this is a good example of, of a publication that we have supported. Um, and then back to the start, uh, that is, uh, yeah, I, I started working here 1st of March 2020. Seven days later, I had to send home all my staff and uh, the art world was closed down. Um, the Danish art museums like museums and art places all over uh, the world has suffered immensely from being locked down and from um, no income from the ticket sale. Uh, not to mention how um, people have missed the cultural um, input they get from uh, going to the cinema, the concerts, uh, the arts um, exhibitions, etc. So very early on, uh, we decided to look at how we could help um, the, the art world uh, due to our, uh, during, uh, uh, according to our fundets, we cannot support music theater. We are only able to support uh, visual arts. So we looked into that uh, when we very early helped um, with the first sort of big extraordinary restart fund in 2020, uh, donating 3.6 million euros to 29 Danish art museums. And in, at that time, we only thought about the art museums because there were other foundations in Denmark that were looking more uh, to help um, broader in the cultural scene, but also uh, especially uh, contemporary arts institutions that did not have a collection. And um, and then this year, we, we, we realized that the, the crisis wasn't over at all. I think many of the institutions in Denmark um, still suffer from the money they have lost from being locked down until now, until recently. And of course, this is a really bad situation, not only for the institutions, but also for all the artists that had uh, exhibitions canceled, that couldn't um, show, that had produced uh, expensive uh, new works, etc., and then lost uh, the possibility of, um, of an attending um, public. And so this time we thought, okay, we because the galleries did quite well, actually, the commercial galleries apparently did quite well during COVID. Uh, so it was not so much the commercial scene we were looking at as it was uh, how to help small artist-driven spaces, uh, collective spaces uh, in a very small scale, sometimes run by a few people. Uh, but uh, due to the fact that we, we thought this is like an ecosystem, we cannot only support the big art museums, uh, we also have to support the small 
um, sort of subcultural institutions. And so this time we we donated 5.1 million euros to 62 Danish art venues, some of them really, really small and local, and some of them really big, like Luciana um, in Homelebeck that you probably know. So, so that was twice until now that we that we did these uh, extraordinary restart fundings. We also did something really extraordinary uh, with the National Gallery of Denmark uh, because normally um, the museums can apply for one work uh, that they want to acquire, and we normally don't let. Um, the museums acquire or wish for an enormous amount of works at the same time. But this time we had a dialogue with the National Gallery about a way of supporting the Danish artists. That was in 2020. Um, and also the museum at the same time. So we accepted that you, if they follow certain criteria about diversity, we said we want you to spread your acquisition all over the scene, as many galleries and non-profit places and artist-run places and all kinds of artists uh, should be included, diversity over age, uh, sex, uh, etc. cetera, um, then we would like to support you with one big acquisition. And, and that <clears throat> uh, ended out in a, in, in a historical um, and very significant acquisition by the National Gallery of 104 significant works by altogether 61 Danish contemporary artists. So that was something really extraordinary. Um, and then we also had um, thoughts about how we could help some of the non-commercial um, art uh, forms because uh, obviously performative artists were really hard uh, hidden by by the fact that we couldn't uh, keep meet that we had to keep distance and physical uh, um, sort of presence was not possible so um, as soon as we were able to uh, organize uh, just a little sort of uh, physical uh, presentation in the beginning with it was like for five people or something very small. We organized a performance festival where we invited 18 artists uh, to create new works. And that way we were able to give them a fee and that way support them even though we couldn't buy the works. And then at the end of the day, when the performance uh, festival was ready during the summer of 2020, actually we were allowed to, to, to have a much larger audience than we thought when we started. Um, uh, to organize this uh, performance festival. And that's something we never did before. We never uh, organize festivals ourselves. We no normally just support festivals. But in this case, we wanted to support the eight, the artists uh, that work with performance art. And then, um, and then and that's what, what we did at that time. So, um, yeah. Uh, since then, we also, uh, uh, yeah, um helped a lot uh you know uh how to, you know when 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 the institutions uh had sent us applications how to you know uh, modify public and exhibition activities how to help security uh get to the level they they needed to be at um and so on uh that's not something we normally support but in order for them to to get over the crisis and get ready to um uh, to welcome a new audience that is perhaps a little bit afraid and worried that they can get COVID. Uh, this is more details about uh, what we gave to the National Gallery and the festival. Um, and so uh, finally, what I should perhaps say something about in the Danish context is how, how it works here, because I think what is really nice in Denmark, I come uh, for many years uh, from from the applicants uh, side of the table as an art uh, a museum director for many years and and um, I know how much it means that you can get funding from different sources uh, you get kind of your basic funding from the from the state and sometimes from your municipality if you are situated in a nice one of those um, and then you get then you can apply for activities exhibitions acquisitions from private foundation and finally, uh, the more you can make from the audience, uh, the better. And that's also what we learned before COVID, that we should get as many uh, audiences to come and pay as possible. So I think these three sources together is what we call the Danish model. And it works really well because it means that 
if if the political winds go in one direction so that the state and the municipalities decide to to support certain things and the private foundation can help support other things so that it doesn't get too sort of narrow what what kind of trend sort of uh, is uh, is surviving at the moment and i think that's a really healthy and a uh, good way of of securing diversity in the arts scene which i believe is the most important keyword to to creating quality and and liveliness at the arts scene that that must be quality and and diversity so i think that uh, maybe with this introduction to uh, to the new casbeck foundation and um and uh, and the danish model perhaps i should pass the floor and the word on to to the next uh, speaker <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Christine. Thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, introduction to your activities and with these exciting uh, new examples of, of your activity. Uh, I hope we will have a nice uh, continuation of this uh, uh, conversation afterwards. Uh, so now sure. I would like to give floor to uh, Kalle Korhonen from Kone Foundation in Finland. It's a uh, a younger foundation, but also already more than 60 or, or close to 70 years of, uh, uh, of practice, uh, which was founded in 1956. So, uh, Kale, please, uh, the, floor is, uh, the floor is yours to introduce to your foundation and your focus. Thank you, Anda, and thank you for the invitation, and, and thank you, thanks to Christine for 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 a good presentation of the the scan sort of scandinavian model which we also have to some extent in finland so i guess you can hear me now uh, so uh, so about kone foundation of course it's a funny name for a danish person because it mean it would mean wife in, in danish or norwegian but it doesn't mean wife in finnish so it means machine our background, and I'm going to start my presentation now. So, <clears throat> so can you see my presentation now? I think so. Uh, yeah. So, Con uh, Foundation, as Anda said, is now uh, 60. How, how many? How many? 65 years old. It was founded in 1956, and it is a. <clears throat> It's a grant-making foundation uh, now, and then uh, we are independent and unaffiliated, and we also have a, a, there is a sort of con connection with the corporation. However, I, uh, Christina didn't say so much about the, your connection with Carlsberg. Uh, with the company, but in our case, we are now sort of totally independent from the from the company, which is called Kone Corporation. Uh, it's a, it's an elevator and escalator company. Uh, but anyway, as you as you know, our our income comes from the assets we own, and they are an endowment of Kone shares. So we we can. We can fund annually more than 40, 40 million euros uh, in, in grants mostly. And I will tell you a bit more about this uh, very soon. Uh, we are one of the biggest private grant makers in Finland. Uh, uh, there has been a tradition, although we don't have such huge foundations as you have in Denmark, we have had some sort of relatively big foundations that have been active in the in 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 funding research and in funding art for for almost 100 years now so the oldest foundations in finland are from the 19th century but the the, the biggest ones are for, were founded in the the early early 20th century uh, <clears throat> Our values, then, and I'm, I'm because I, I mean, it has been a more recent strategy of foundations to write strategies and not just uh, have their charters at hand. So, uh, our, our, uh, by bylaws, our statutes are very, very sort of broad. We can support, we can support uh, 
um, almost any kinds of cultural activities uh, in Finnish society, which then can can include other countries, work in other countries too. So as we interpret it, but our our values in our most recent strategy are academic and artistic freedom, uh, which is the the most important value. Then uh, ecological and social awareness, uh, plurality, boldness, uh, long-term approaches, and communality. As I, as I translated, of course, our, the concepts are we use are in Finnish, so so there are no exact um, correspondence in, in in English. But then you will understand what they are <clears throat> from these translations. Uh, we are. Our funding is mostly for research. Approximately th three quarters of the funding budget goes to research. We fund, and we don't fund everything in, in research. We don't have fund science so much, uh, uh, or natural science, if you, if you use that term. We fund humanities, social sciences, environmental sciences, and artistic research, which is something uh, which is uh, artistic work with an academic research element. <clears throat> and the share of art in our case is about one quarter. So it's currently a bit more than 10 million euros per year. Uh, we fund all fields of art, but we focus on, on ars gratia artis, as I, as I put it in Latin here, uh, art for the sake of art. Uh, as we do focus on, on, on research for the sake of research, not in order to solve immediate problems in society. Uh, you can do that, of course, but you don't have to focus on those problems. And you don't have to do applied arts. You don't have to say that your art will immediately benefit uh, the health of people or so, or, or the GN gross national product of or Finland or, or something like that. Uh, and unlike, unlike the Kasberg uh, Foundation, or funded, we, we predominantly fund artistic work. So we don't fund, we, we don't have an art collection. Uh, I showed the, the, the picture of the manner where our office is situated, but we just have, mm, our art collection consists of the, the works that are here, in, in the Lautasari manor and in our other, other manor where we have a residence in southwestern Finland. <clears throat> so artistic work is the, uh, and of course in research, we fund research work. So we fund the people with grants, with personal grants. Then of course, with the other expenses they need to, in order to do their work. And what is also important for us is cooperation between academic researchers and, and artists. So uh, uh, is, as, as, as far as the Finnish uh, funding scene is concerned, we, we have had, or the Kone Foundation has had a, a niche of being a slightly different funder from the mainstream, uh, so to say, because as I said, there is a group of relatively big foundations who fund research and art, but who are often viewed as more traditionalist, although they might not even be so traditionalist. But, uh, and, and, and our funding, of course, it occasionally overlaps with other funders and with the public funders. Uh, and then uh, now I'm going to, because I, I noticed that that Christina was talking about the, the, the answering the questions and and asked me in the, in the email, so I'm going to briefly go into those questions because my 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 presentation is almost finished. Uh, how the pandemic influenced your our focus and our programming? Uh, we also uh, we increased our funding to some extent and organized two special funding calls. Uh, one of them was a home residency program with 1.5 million euros in grants to about 100 grantees. So uh, 
a, a grant for many people to do their work at home last year when it was impossible to do it elsewhere. And then we had a special funding round this year for 17 institutions of performing arts or visual arts, uh, which amounted to 3.5 million euros. And which was, there was no uh, funding call or funding round, which would, would have been open, but we called it uh, a sort of investigative or investigative uh, foundation work. Uh, those we we chose uh, specialists who who then chose a long list and then we contacted them and then we uh, we chose from there uh, and at a large percentage of the of the group received a grant which was quite large in this case about uh, between two hundred and three hundred thousand euros because it was for several years. Uh, Yes, I think, uh, yes, and then uh, because generally our funding decisions are based on anonymous peer review, so uh, that is the method we use in, in making decisions for, for funding when we fund the, when we decide or when our board decides uh, which artists and which academics to fund. So that's, that was, I think, yeah, that's my <clears throat> presentation, Baldias, and, and, and I, I hope we have a good discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, and now uh, let's uh, move to our Latvian guest, uh, to VVE Foundation from, uh, from Riga, and uh, not only from Riga, Vita will tell more. Uh, so thank you very much, Vitek, for coming today, and uh, please introduce us to your um, new foundation, which you have established just a couple of years ago. Thank you so much for having me on this very experienced and um, established panel of foundations. Indeed, we are a considerably young foundation. We started just in 2018. Um, it's, um, it was founded by three founders, uh, a lawyer, an architect and an uh, art historian. We all share a passion for arts and we decided three years ago that we want to give it a structure to primarily just share it with the public. Our main mission is to promote uh, contemporary art and art education in Latvia. And so far, our core initiatives have been uh, creation of Pavelosta Residency. Uh, Pavelosta is the name of the location where the artist residency is based in. We have uh, provided production grants, we do uh, commissions, we organize exhibitions, we support research, and we continue on growing our art collection. Uh, it's important to also mention that we always supplement whatever we do with the educational and public programming as we believe in the participatory approach to art. And I have just outlined uh, the three main values that we are always uh, having in mind when, whenever we think of a new initiative. First of all, it's an interaction. We still find that Latvian art scene is a very local and disconnected one. Uh, so we think it's very important still to promote uh, global art and artists uh, to come to Latvia. Um, we do this by inviting also creators over to Latvia. And we also consider that Latvian art and artists are still not represented globally enough. Uh, another value is inclusion. We see ourselves as a platform for uh, collaborations and we don't really discriminate against any kind of uh, art media. And the third one is knowledge. Uh, believe it or not, we still do not have a contemporary art museum in Latvia. The gallery scene is very scarce. So there's a huge vacuum of knowledge uh, around the contemporary arts. So we consider that the, one of our main missions to 
uh, give an opportunity for learning and also for teaching. I'll just briefly and shortly go through the main initiatives that we've done uh, during these three years, regardless of COVID. Situation um, back in 2018, uh, we did a large show by uh, a distinguished Swedish artist of Latvian origin, Laris Strunke. And in a few days, we'll be opening a large show by an Austrian avant-garde artist, uh, Hermann Nietzsche. I keep my fingers crossed that it will be opening because we had to postpone it uh, three times already. Uh, in parallel, we still keep supporting uh, up-and-coming Latvian artists by uh, giving out scholarships um, and uh, helping them to do their own shows. Uh, just recently, we had a Latvian artist uh, having her work uh, um, exhibited in Turkey, for example. Uh, we, like I said, we collaborate with different institutions. Uh, we've supported more than 10 uh, different art projects, uh, including, for example, two uh, contemporary operas recently. And being big fans of residencies, we also support Latvian artists uh, going to residencies outside of Latvia. Uh, yeah, and, and then we also uh, run our exhibition program in the residency itself. We have an adjacent art gallery where we uh, change uh, our exhibitions on a monthly or two months basis. We display our own collection and also we allow residents to show their works in the, res in the gallery. Um, there is a plan also to work in a, a sculpture park, but that's in the planning. Uh, education, like I said, it's very important. We see, as, we see it as a main um, obstacle uh, for con contemporary art to widen its audience because of the lack of education around it. So we always, like I said, uh, complement our uh, exhibitions or um, also residency uh, with the um, lectures workshops. Um, for example, in residency, we collaborate with the local uh, School of Art for Children. And we also have a community of weavers uh, in our residency. They have a dedicated space there. And they are sharing their traditional knowledge with the public. Um, collection, yeah, we still keep on expanding our collection, but I think it's important to um, uh, stress that uh, it doesn't really have a specific target, uh, nor does any, nor does it have any commercial interest, mm, because really the interaction, exchange, and cooperation with artists is something that motivates us. So we see our collection primarily as the way to support the artists and kind of provide a platform for uh, audience to see the art and meet the artists. Um, and residency, yes, Pavel was the residency, or in short, we call it PEAR. Uh, we opened it uh, just uh, this year in May. It's brand new. Um, and we see it as an interdisciplinary place for um, thinking and uh, like artistic research. It's uh, like you see, it's uh, based in an older building on a very remote uh, place of Latvia, about two and a half hours driving from Riga on the west coast uh, of uh, Latvia. Yeah. And again, values that we um, have outlined for our residency. We, uh, think that and hope that it will be a thought enabling um, space. It will be a community of meaning. Uh, I really heard uh, several people who spend time in our residency admitting that uh, the place can have really transformed the way they uh, think about their practice. And one very important aspect of also of our residency is that we believe in tradition. Uh, like I said, we have a studio of weavers working in it and we have an adjacent garden where we um, uh, uh, grow healing herbs. So we believe that combining a traditional and innovation is something that can come up, like lead to unexpected um, artistic solutions. Yeah, here you see the building. Like I said, it's like located on a remote uh, uh, part of Latvia. 
And the building was uh, itself built in 1901. We renovated it uh, just now, like I said, opened in May. It's totally refurbished, totally renovated. We have four artist um, uh, spaces, meaning basically studios that they're fully equipped. Artists can stay there full time. And then we have two working studios, a library, um, artist, arts gallery, and a shared kitchen and um, there's a common table to meet. Uh, residency will have four open calls every year uh, with a length of two months uh, each. Uh, currently we have uh, a first one ongoing. Uh, thanks to actually, I uh, almost forgot to mention that we're super thankful to Nordic Culture Point for supporting this residency. So the first open call is happening um, and being financed by the Nordic Culture Point. It's led by the Kiasma chief curator, Joao Laya. And we currently have people uh, from Iceland, Norway, Russia, and Norway, Russia, Iceland. Oh, I forgot the first one. <laughs> but it's a very international group of people working in residency at this moment. That's in short what we have accomplished uh, during the three years we operate. Thank you, Vita. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Exciting to learn what exciting activities are going on uh, despite the uh, restrictions of the uh, last, uh, last couple years almost. Um, let me ask you uh, a bit broader, maybe a philosophical question even. Uh, you, uh, like a uh, new Carlsberg Foundation, uh, prior to this foundation, there was already a Carlsberg Foundation, which was, and I, I suppose, is still focusing on research. Uh, the same can be said about Kone Foundation, which also started uh, especially with a uh, focus on research. Um, but in recent years, recent decades, one could say that art is at the forefront of uh, of your foundations and, um, and the same uh, for Vita, uh, they have chosen art, uh, contemporary art, as their main topic for their residency. So what is about contemporary art uh, or art in general uh, that you think expresses this zeitgeist more maybe at this point than other forms of culture and art why have you chosen uh, this uh, form um, as a means to connect with your society, with contemporary world? Is there something special about, as, uh, about art at this particular moment? Maybe we can start with Christine. Uh, you have muted your uh, your uh, microphone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. But the, the problem is that I can only see the PowerPoint from the VV Foundation, uh, but I can say something anyway. Um, do, do you see each other? Yeah, that's yeah. better. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, just to explain the difference between the Carlsberg Foundation and the new Carlsberg Foundation, those have always been two different uh, individual foundations with each their own board and their own uh, fundets. And uh, the Carlsberg Foundation still exists um, and they uh, support, they still support research and they actually support with much larger amounts than we support uh, the art world with. So it's not correct to say that it's a time geist. These two foundations were, were existing side by side for many, many years. Um, and for for us, it's, it's we are we are sort of supposed to follow what's put in the fundets by the founder, and it says that we should support research as well as contemporary art. So I don't think it's correct to say that it's been changing because we have always been supporting contemporary art, but we we also support um, research within art historian uh, fields. Uh, 
at museums and at universities. But I'm glad to hear that you think that uh, contemporary art uh, plays a new role in society at the moment. I think that would, that would be really relevant. Thank you. Gala, what's your take on this? Yeah, yes, I agree with Christina that um, for us too, uh, contemporary art has been has been supported for for some time already, and and um, and I mean research is our main 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 uh, topic. Uh, research funding is is much bigger for us than than art art funding, but I mean I mean with contemporary art, uh, uh, of course, we often one often has the feeling that that it's not. It remains a bit in the shade in a, in a society which usually has some some sort of uh, structures that are uh, that can be conventional and and can be can be traditionalist <laughs> the word I used before but I mean uh, that's why that's why I think at Kone Foundation art has become more important in recent years and and of course it's it's true that. We didn't fund art at all in the the 90s when the foundation was much smaller. Uh, but but then we began to fund it with the when when the foundation founded the Sari residency, which is in in southwestern Finland, uh, where which was an artist residency. And then uh, some years after that, we began to fund artistic work too. So anyway, I think uh, <clears throat> the main reason for us would be that it's it uh, it has the risk of being left in the shade, contemporary art. In, although in, in Finnish society there are other structures to support it, of course, too. Thank you. Vita, why why did you choose uh, contemporary art to be the highlight of your um, program? Well, like I mentioned, um, art and specifically contemporary art is the passion that we all share, the three founders. So it just came naturally that that's something that we love and we want to share with the public. But I also want to say that um, although um, like I said, our main mission is to promote com contemporary art and Pavel was the artist residency also have the word art in its name. Uh, we consider ourselves a multidisciplinary place, meaning that we invite to the residency, not just artists, but thinkers of any kind, being uh, philosophers, researchers, um, writers uh, and so on, uh, hoping that the language of art is something that unites them and hopefully leads to uh, some productive collaborations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Christina mentioned this Danish model uh, where there is a state uh, foundations, uh, private foundations and yeah, private, private individual money and, and, and uh, um, visitors of the shows and, and the, uh, various cultural uh, events. Um, so where do you see uh, your role uh, currently in your specific society? Do you feel uh, some specific niche, you know? Uh, maybe you feel some gap which is left by uh, empty uh, by uh, state institutions or other foundations. Do you feel a uh, responsibility for certain activities? Or, or, or you don't feel such responsibility. Uh, what is your cultural role currently in your society? Uh, yeah, I think for us uh, in Denmark, the, that's, there are several things. Um, very few museums have the budget to acquire artworks for the collections and that is a fact, even though by law they are, um, they have to make sure that they collect. But it's really hard for them with the budgets, the, the public budgets. So in that um, regard, we play a very big role. 
Um, I also think that the collaboration between the universities and the museums when it comes to art historical research, also research that deals with exhibition um, programming, exhibition design, how people experience exhibitions and so on, is something that we have been able to support by supporting uh, research collaborations between museums and universities. And then at this moment, I think in Denmark, there's a very uh, interesting moment after Corona, after COVID, because we went through a period with very sort of um, anti-elite cultural politics, where the kind of art that we would support would often be um, described as something very elitarian, only for a very few people in the society, right against the visions of our founder who felt that art was for everybody and should be for everybody. So there has been this right-wing kind of um, uh, anti-elite movement within the cultural politics of Denmark. And this has been part of a polarized, I think, society in general, where you have sort of the elite against uh, all the others, which has to do with globalization and many other things. And I think it's a movement that we also see in other countries, uh, for example, the, the Brexit um, event was also something that you can uh, uh, understand in that perspective. And I think this polarization in society is very bad because we, we are living in, in difficult times with a lot of issues that many artists address in their arts works, even though they are not supposed to, as it was said before um, uh, by Kalle, that they are not supposed to come up with solutions or results or even um, make sure that um, some kind of income is growing or anything. But still what they deal with is very relevant for many people. So I think that at this moment after COVID there, the population really were missing art and culture. The politicians suddenly realized that society cannot do without culture and people need art and culture. So they have suddenly changed the rhetorics we just had the Danish prime minister talking about a new golden age for art and culture last week, which is really something new. We haven't heard of that for many years. Um, and I think that's an open window for us to help um, create a better uh, understanding of the uh, of the role and, and, and importance of art and culture in society together with, uh, with the politicians and other foundations, civic, society, um, institutions themselves, et cetera. And I think that's a very important role that we can play right now in order to um, have a new cultural political rhetoric about what we do. And if I may uh, add to you, Christine, uh, do you feel uh, appreciated or, or taken into consideration uh, with your efforts? For instance... Uh, Absolutely. You do, yeah, from also from state. Uh, yeah, 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 I think uh, absolutely. Um, when when COVID uh, came, there was this extraordinary uh, collaboration between the government and the foundations, um, and also the the former cultural minister put down a whole rescue team um, to describe the the challenges that the whole cultural scene was facing. And I think we were invited to participate in that work, uh, of course, for strategic reasons that, that they don't want to have us against them, but also because I really felt that now we have to collaborate and uh, what we do is important. And that doesn't only go for us, it also goes for other foundations. Um, also, if we look at um, surveys made within the, within the population, you can see that the foundations in Denmark have a very high legitimacy, uh, legitimacy uh, in the population that people think we are doing important things with the money that we uh, give out in, in, uh, in funding. And that's important also for the politicians because they look a lot at how, how people think about um, yeah, foundations. Thank you. Carla, you, you were ready to continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was very interesting to hear yeah. that you had a sort of extraordinary collaboration in Denmark, because we had the same, we had exactly the same phenomenon in Finland. We had uh, a sort of uh, extraordinary funding, uh, which was organized together by, by the state and, and, and some private foundations. And, and we also have the same, uh, we have the polarization 
phenomenon as far as art art is re, is concerned and and even even as far as, as research is re, is concerned especially humanities and social sciences but uh, but i mean uh, in finland now the situation is is quite interesting because we have we have had a strong funding for, for the arts coming from the lottery uh, lottery uh, profits so the state lottery profits have have been a source of funding for for arts but since they are now very rapidly diminishing uh, there's a, there's a sort of funding crisis in in public art funding and it means very strong a very strong interest and a very strong demand for private funding even in arts so more more stronger than than it what it used to be so there's a, we have to sort of keep a balance between uh, what we can do as a foundation or as foundations what we can do as private funders what our statutes say allow us to do and and then what where there are gaps that are being formed in, in in art funding and in research funding in society because of of diminishing public funding. Thank you, uh, Vita. Uh, how do you feel with your new foundation? Uh, do you feel some signs that there be uh, there will be. Uh, cooperation between your foundation and state and uh, other foundations or you have the sense that you are left alone to struggle your, on your own? I not only see signs but we actually cooperate both with the state and municip municipal institutions and it's been fantastic so far. Uh, be it uh, National Museum of Art that we do an exhibition of Herman Nietzsche at this stage. Uh, the collaboration is very professional and I found it very productive and useful and also municipal um, uh, Pavlos, the municipality has been very welcoming and we don't ask much but whatever we ask they're very very uh, forthcoming so I can't say anything uh, bad really. <laughs> it was not the purpose. <laughs> It was not a purpose, but uh, I'm happy to hear yeah, that there at least there is a dialogue. Uh, you have uh, various uh, aims for your uh, foundations and, uh, for instance, uh, New Carlsberg Foundation, you say that you want to uh, promote uh, enrichment of people's life through art and uh, developing uh, critical thinking through art projects. Um, do you measure your impact? Do you measure this uh, achieving of your goals mm -hmm. and how do you do it and maybe there are some examples where you you can say that you really made a difference uh, in some uh, yeah. aspect it's a really good question and you know um, many foundations in Denmark have been um, changing in the direction of this kind of professionalization where they really um, measure impact in many different ways with quantitative methods, with qualitative methods, you know, interviewing uh, audiences, um, etc. And I think in that respect, the new Carlsberg Foundation is very, very old fashioned. Um, we, we, we have never actually measured anything. I mean, when I started here, 1st of March 2020, the first thing I did was to count uh, how many sort of women did we support, how many uh, men did we support just to have some kind of statistics and how, as I say, you know, all these basic uh, data that uh, we never sort of counted or, or, um, or, or asked for. Um, and I also think that it's something we're going to look at in the strategy that we are working on at the moment. Um, we did some few evaluations of some of the projects we did within um, educational field uh, and also the performance festival actually last year we've, we evaluated, uh, but it's not something that we normally do. Um, and I know, as I mentioned from other foundations that they ask um, recipients to really do that. I mean, because I've been fundraising as, an, as a museum director for many years myself and know how much work and effort we had to put into to measuring the the impacts. Um, 
On the other hand, it's hard to measure many of these things. Um, so I think you should be careful how much you imagine that you should be measuring in order to legitimize what you do. But um, but it's something that we're going to discuss, I'm sure, in the new board um, during this process of developing our strategies. And I'm really curious to hear the experience of um, of the Kona Foundation, because I'm sure you have some uh, knowledge uh, uh, that uh, could be very helpful and important to to share. But I, I as mentioned, it's not a practice that we've been very active in, uh, strangely enough. Um, no, it's a very nice, you know, artistic gesture, you know, just do good things and not uh, not measure and not uh, uh, lose yourself in these uh, minute uh, details and yeah. uh, calculations. So, but just to add something, another trend in Denmark is governance. I mean, there's a very sort of uh, big focus on transparency and governance. And in that respect, it can be hard to be transparent because you don't have any data that you can share. And so I think actually now there's also these new laws coming uh, in terms of whitewashing. And um, I think we're going to have a new law in Denmark about that also uh, going to concern us because uh, we should be able to document that our money are spent uh, in, the, in the right way. Otherwise the legitimacy of foundations could um, be, be, be heard. And I think that's the other dimension, you know, the governance aspect. Thank you. Kalle, please. Yes, very good points again by Christina. Uh, uh, as, uh, as she, uh, exact, well, almost exactly like the new Kasberg fund that we, we don't talk about measuring our, our impact. We, we sometimes organize uh, maybe impact assessment, which is qualitative, uh, then and uh, addresses certain maybe thematic funding calls but now since our values now for the first half of this decade are academic and artistic freedom so we we really try to uh, uh, counteract the tendency in society to require profit from every activity so even even require immediate profit from from scientific activity research activity or artistic activity uh, but of, of course, then, then there is the accountability side or the legitimacy side, and which we have to take into account. So we have to, uh, we have to somehow take care that that the money is well spent, so to say. It's not, it's not sort of wasted. Uh, and but but <clears throat> that that and that that comes from trust, of course. We. We try to select the grantees uh, carefully. Uh, of course, we occasionally take risks, which, which the foundations can do. But and then, then we support and and uh, try to be in contact with them. So in a way, in ways that what help them to do their work. We we have in fact what we call grants plus a grants plus program, which means that we. We support the people we need. Uh, we fund. We support the people we fund with other things than just money. We we offer them some sort of spaces for for meetings and then then uh, some trainings that are not in the in 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 exactly the fields that they are working on uh, and so on. So I mean, <clears throat> there's again a balance one has to find. In, in doing in funding research and art and I mean uh, I, uh, and, I, and I of course hope that there, there will always be funders who who are not not focusing on immediate results immediate profit but also on on long term impacts. Yeah, we, thank you, Vita. Uh, what? impact do you hope to make or you plan to make? Uh, what's uh, your observation about your society where you operate? Oh, for us it's probably <clears throat> too early to really uh, measure any impact and obviously it should also be measured that by those who feel it. 
I can just say that, you know, during these few years, we felt like tremendously happy just hearing people saying, you know, this show changed the way I look at the art or some have even said like it has changed my life. Um, and also it makes me very happy, for example, just pass by the residency at night and see people working on it, in it. So this is something that I measure for myself and it makes me happy. We don't really have any long-term measurement targets or anything like that. And uh, Vita, you also, as a lawyer, you are in contact with, mm, with uh, many or substantial number of uh, other wealthy, civic-minded uh, entrepreneurs or other professionals who have uh, acquired, uh, accumulated some uh, amount of means and would be interested also to start their own foundations. Uh, so, what, uh, what recommendation do you give to these people? Uh, what are the signs? Where could they invest their money? Um... Uh, indeed, there have been several who have been asking me for advice and all I can say is just follow your heart. It's that easy. Uh, if you want to do something in arts, you have to love it. You know, there's no foundation without the passion behind it. And if you like art, just keep looking and looking and looking and um, you'll see what you like or you want to support. And I can just say that there are enormous things that can be still done in contemporary art, uh, be it um, public display of contemporary art, be it uh, cataloging, be it critical writing on contemporary art, there's so many things still missing yeah, that if you want to do something in contemporary art, you will for sure find things to do here. Uh, yeah, Vita mentioned this word passion. Um, do you, Christine and Kalle, also have uh, passion uh, um, about your work and which aspect maybe particularly uh, arouses this, uh, this passion in you and makes you be motivated and inspired to, to go to work and uh, do all your activities? Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, passion was extremely uh, key to the founder of the New Carlsberg Foundation, Karl Jakobsen. If you read his speeches and um, what he said to people when he was um, in public, um, you can see that it's all about passion and, and that this passion for art um, really made him want to collect, but also to share. And I think um, um, that's what we should keep in our hearts. I mean, um, of course, with governance and um, laws, etc., we should be regulated in a way that allows foundation to survive also in modern times. And sometimes perhaps you would say that passion is the opposite of professionalism, but I don't think so. It shouldn't be like that. I think that it's important that we are still passion driven. Um, and when, um, uh, when you talk about people saying, you know, this changed my life, or these are also these kind of experiences that I feel can sometimes make you want to go to work tomorrow, even though there's a lot of, well, I don't know what, uh, bureaucratic work as well, because you feel that you can share art experiences and your passion for art with, with people, um, especially in times where many people think still that well, visual arts is not for me, it's something only for the elite. We still have these social barriers. And that's um, something where I think passion can build bridges. But of course, um, uh, the passion should also be with the artists and it should be us that sort of helps them keep passionate about what they do because it can be very, really uphill to be an artist and make a living from that. So that's also what's passion about, it's about um, um, encouraging the art world to go on because it's not the normal sort of way to create a key career or make a, make money. So that's also what's passionate about for me in this role and position that I have. Thank you. 
Kale, what's passion, passionate uh, in your yes, profession and yes, uh, in your foundation? Is, uh, that absolutely, it's uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, it is very present in, in our current board, board of trustees and, and in our personnel too. And I must say that it's also, it's very, very much required even in, also in, in research funding. So if you, and then the passion can, there are risks for, for, for passion nowadays in, in, in counting, for example, if you start to, if, if, if art funding or research funding becomes too focused on, on counting the outputs, counting the exhibitions, counting the, the audience numbers, counting the publications and so on, then you can, you can lose the, the passion, which is, uh, which is an absolute requirement. Uh, yes, and um, the world is uh, becoming increasingly complex, as you already, your, uh, your foundation statements already predicted and uh, affirms it. Uh, so, how do you see where will your future focus will have to turn, or you want to turn your uh, future focus to include what kind of subjects, what kind of artistic production? Um, you have been already quite innov innovative, all of you, but what do you project in the in a, in a coming, uh, coming years or coming term? Christina, maybe you again, you want to start? <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Um, well, I still think that public art is a very interesting field of uh, um, of developing, um, and many new artists uh, appear with great ideas about how you can um, work in public spaces. So I think for sure we're going to to focus on that. Um, I also think that we are challenged when it comes to the. The, the globalization and the international relationships because of the climate crisis, but also after the pandemic um, that people don't travel so much. And I'm, I'm curious to think about how we can work internationally in the future, because I also always felt that it's not enough to have a national scene. You have to exchange with other um, scenes in order to develop and also in order to understand each other. Um, across cultures and across natures. So I think we have some dilemmas at the moment because it's it seems to be a bad thing to travel as much. But on the other hand, we want to keep exchanging um, ideas um, across borders. So I think that's really tricky. And I'm curious to see how we're going to deal with that. Also to hear what you think about this problem. Um, this is a way of meeting across borders, which I really appreciate on Teams, uh, or is it uh, something else? It's uh, Zoom, <laughs> uh, which is great, and we learned a lot from that possibility. But I also think that um, the materiality of art should still be uh, something that you can experience physically. So I think for many museums, the business model is challenged, um, and I, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with that in the future. Vita. Yes, I, I think we have to, uh, because I mean, inter crossing borders is important for us too, and, and, and crossing national borders, yes, definitely, but then also crossing disciplinary borders and between, between artists and, and academics. So, uh, but the, the, what is lacking in, the, in that field is other sort of permanent positions or the structures that you would have you can have you can always have a project in which you you uh, pay grants for academics and artists who work together then for some time but you don't then in the end you, they will end up in different places they can't continue their work together there's no institution that would uh, allow them to work together for, for a long time. So, so I mean, and, and the same goes for even, even between academic disciplines. So uh, we, we have to be even more active in, in, that, in, that, in that field, in that situation, in order to help with that. Thank you. Lita. 
Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, well, there are two initiatives that we're currently working on. One is in the um, public art scene that Christina mentioned. In Latvia, it's still very um, non-explored. Uh, so we are working currently on a sculpture garden adjacent to the Pavlos residency. That's one of our up and coming projects. Another one is a publishing house. Um, during COVID times, uh, I see that people uh, have time to read more and more. So, and we still see a lot, lack of um, literature on art, especially contemporary art here. So that's something else that we are working on right now. And uh, we are close to the, 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 the end almost. Uh, no questions have popped in, uh, but um, uh, as this uh, inspiration for this Nordic talk uh, was a developing situation in the Baltic region that there are new foundations coming up and people want to be involved with arts and cultures and with art and culture, uh, you, uh, Christine and Kale, uh, you come from a much more uh, um, longer tradition uh, society in this regard. Uh, what would be your encouragement? Why should people create their own foundations based on your uh, founders? What would you say? Why? Why should uh, people do it? And uh, what's the benefit to the society from it? Mm, if I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is in Denmark to, to do that. Uh, I, I don't know much about um, the law and the, um, uh, the possibilities of, of doing that. But if we just think about the, the, the possibility of, of, of creating a foundation, I think it's a good way of um, placing um, resources in a meaningful way in order to help uh, getting a better future for our children and grandchildren. And I think it should be very high flying purposes like that. Um, and typically when you look into the history of foundations, you will see that uh, there's a sp spirit coming from say medical research or something specific that an individual has experienced as being important in their own private life and then broadens it out into a foundation. I think that's a good way of, for an individual to, to, to help society in a, in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that's the most important uh, purpose of and, and reason why one should do it. Um, but I'm not sure how, how easy it is in Denmark, actually. I have, I have no idea. As, a, as an idea, as an idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I think that, uh, Yes, absolutely. You would need to uh, be thinking about the, the profit of the whole society or the whole humanity. Uh, and then I, I would say that, well, because if, if one starts a new foundation, which is, of course, in, in Finland it is possible, and I guess in Latvia too, because it, we have heard the wonderful VV Foundation. Uh, so you can, because people can choose uh, between setting up an endowment that, or uh, an endowment that 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 sort of stays there, or you can start a foundation which works as a spending down foundation. So you can have it for a, a, a set of years, like ten years or twenty years or so. And 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 if if but anyway, I I would still advise people to think in longer term so that because we will still, there will be arts and culture in 50 years or 100 years from now. And, 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 and we must bear this in mind. And, and uh, because it has, of course, you always have the possibility that you see an, a, a problem, a big problem in your society or in the global society that you want to solve. And there you have very good, you will have very good advice from uh, foundation professionals or philanthropy professionals in the US, for example, where such foundations are numerous uh, or such, and such philanthropists are numerous. But then, then it would be a good idea to 
think in a, a slightly longer term and to think big. So I think, I mean, uh, to look at the, have a broader view than, than just the, the problem, the definite problem you want to solve. Thank you, thank you. And Vita, what, what kind of society do you envision for yourself in, uh, in, in 10 years time or wh where would you wish to be? What kind of uh, colleagues you would like to have? Colleagues in the art field? Well, the same that I have now. I don't really <laughs> hope for anything better that we have right now. Well, like I said, we really uh, work based on the three values that I mentioned. So I hope that, you know, whatever we do now will hopefully strengthen both the um, interaction between Latvia and global art, um, expand the knowledge of uh, local community about the contemporary art, uh, and also hopefully uh, have the art uh, uh, field be inclusive because it's similar. I was quite interested to hear that in Finland and Denmark, uh, both Christina and Carl mentioned that uh, there is a polarization uh, that you feel in an art field. And that's even more, I think, uh, relevant for Latvia. So hopefully um, uh, this go grows much smaller. Um, if you have some uh, parting words, uh, you are uh, welcome to, to, to share them now. Uh, uh, from my side, I am very uh, thankful to you that you allocated time out of your busy schedules to share how your organizations uh, um, speak about your values, your set of values, and uh, how it can be inspiring for others to, uh, to create this uh, set of values for the future and leave your uh, legacy and influence uh, meaningfully yeah, the future. Uh, it was very inspiring, very uh, profound uh, revelations and insights. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you have anything to add at the end, please um, do it now. <laughs> Well, if I can wish, uh, wish luck for, for the VV Foundation and the Latvian art scene, which is, I, and if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know because colleagues are, can, can sometimes help in this field, in this field of philanthropy. Great. It's a good, uh, good word, Scala, because uh, as I understand, Vita is heading uh, to your residency in a week's time. Is it true, Vita? I'm heading to Helsinki in two days, but uh, we plan on visiting Mustarinda, but uh, apparently for um, COVID restrictions it's not accessible at this stage, uh, so mm -hmm. next time. Next time. Mm -hmm. Christina, Vita, uh, final words? No, I just want to say thank you too, and I also find it very interesting to follow uh, the development that, that you have seen uh, with the VV Foundation, and I hope that uh, it will have a big impact, even though you don't measure it so much, <laughs> perhaps. No, but thank you for the dialogue, and um, for me also as a new uh, chairwoman, it's nice to get to know you, so maybe we could stay in touch in the future, because I think it's really valuable to hear about your experiences also uh, in Finland. So, no, I was just really happy to participate. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the same for me. Very useful. Thank you so much. And hopefully we keep on discussing uh, our issues in the future. Yeah. Thanks to Nordic Culture Point. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you to Norden uh, for providing this uh, venue and uh, platform for this event to take place. And thank you for Nordic Talks, who will hopefully include it, this, uh, this talk in their podcast series. So thank you very much uh, to my guests and thank you to our listeners. This uh, video will be available uh, online and Nordic uh, uh, Norden uh, website, Facebook page and website, so we, we can share it further. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.